6th of April, 1864, a strong patrol set out from the fort at Kaitaka, south of New Plymouth. A company each of Imperial and Colonial Infantry under Captain T.J.W. Lloyd of the 57th Regiment. He had just arrived from England. The patrol's mission was to burn crops in abandoned villages. The war in Taranaki had long been quiet, and they piled their arms to take a break at the foot of this hill, the Akua. Suddenly they were attacked by Māori warriors yelling a new war cry, Ho! 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 The surprised troops were routed. Captain Lloyd and six others were killed and twelve wounded. Survivors stated that the enemy rushed upon them, barking like dogs, and that they seemed to have no fear of death. Māori attackers at Tahuahu were followers of a new religion, Paimārere. Its founder was Te Ua Haumene. Paimārere means good and peaceful. The evidence suggests to me that Te Ua himself was deeply committed towards peace. But he also preached Māori unity, Māori independence from the Pākehā government, and the holding of the land. In the hands of some of his followers, Paimārere revived Māori resistance. It certainly spelt doom for Captain Lloyd and his men. Lloyd was decapitated. His head was preserved and carried around the North Island by Pai Marero missionaries. For Te Ua, it was a symbol of the triumph of good over evil. For many of his followers, it symbolised the triumph of Māori over Pākehā. For Taranaki, it signalled a new and still more bitter round of the New Zealand wars. Three weeks after the killing of Lloyd, another party of Paimarere followers launched an attack on the British fort of Sentry Hill, or Te Morere, north of New Plymouth. This rash assault was blasted flat by massed Enfield rifles firing at close, clear targets from perfect cover. About 30 Māori fell to Pākehā rifles. But Paimarere was about to face an even more deadly enemy, Māori Kupapa. Increasingly, the colonial army was Māori as well as European. After the Waikato War, Kupapa, Māori fighting on the Pākehā side, became more numerous and important. In Taranaki, the main Kupapa group was the lower river Hapu of the great Whanganui tribe. Kupapa commitment varied a great deal. Some were only nominally on the side of the government, others were heavily committed. The one thing virtually all Kupapa had in common was that they never obeyed the orders of their European officers unless it suited them. There are a number of cases of so-called native contingents marching through the bush with their ostensible European leaders following hundreds of metres behind. From the Kupapa viewpoint, the government was fighting on their side rather than the other way around. In the greatest clash between Paimarere and Kupapa, no Europeans at all were involved. In May of 1864, a subordinate Paimarere prophet, Mātene Rangi Tawira, took the new religion to the hapū of the upper Whanganui River. They eagerly embraced it. A war party set out, apparently to attack Whanganui town, but they reckoned without the attitude of their relatives. The lower river hapū saw Whanganui as their town, full of their Pākehā. Kin clashed in a ritualised but bloody battle on an island in the Whanganui River on the 14th of May, 1864. It was witnessed from the Ho-Ho side by H.D. Bates, the young son of a British colonel and an Atiawa woman. We came down in a number of large war canoes, all painted and adorned with rokura, and decorated with carved figureheads and stern posts. That night, there was great excitement, with hakas and much whaikōrero. We children were scored in our part of the conflict by the woman, we were to give a kind of moral support to the warriors by waving out hands, open palms backwards towards our shoulders and crying, Hapa, Hapa, so that the bullets would fly harmless past our champions' heads. And that was the incantation taught by Martini, who had learned it from the Uahumene. We youngsters thought it was all great fun, all this excitement and the Hapa business.
very early in the morning, our pick fighting men, numbering over a hundred, crossed over to the shingly beach at the north end of the island. They danced their peru peru on the beach, and we saw them move back into the manuka to wait for their opponents. Then I saw a long line of armed men from Ranana. The kupapas coming down the hill on the opposite side of the river. All our men were now quite hidden from our view. Then, very soon, we heard the first shots and volleys of gunfire, and it was bang, 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 and fighting yells, and the island was half hidden in smoke. The kupapas first volley was fired too high, and not many of our men fell. The government party then had sudden fears as to whether, after all, the incantations of Pai Marere had made Martini and his warriors invulnerable to bullets. The first volley of the Ho-Hos killed and wounded several of the Kupapas, and they were yielding ground in panic when Tamihana Te Aiwa, one of their leading chiefs, stood firm and shot two Ho-Hos with his double barrel gun and Tomahawk the third. The Kupapa then rallied, and there was a battle at close quarters with Tomahawk and Gunba. The Ho-Hos broke and fed across the river, leaving about 40 killed. Our prophet Martini had received a wound and was swimming across the river. Haimona Hiroti gave his meri to Temuro, who was afterwards a policeman in Wanganui, and pointing to the swimmer said, Yonder's your fish. Temuro dashed into the rapids and overtook Martini, just as he reached our side of the river and was grasping some overhanging shrubs in an effort to haul himself up the steep bank. The Kupapa warrior seized him by his long hair and killed him with a smashing blow of his meri on the side of his head. He returned to the island calling the dead prophet after him and dragging the body ashore on the shingle said the haimuna inna to ika here's your fish the island was called Moto, the grateful Pākehā of Whanganui built a monument here at Moto Gardens to commemorate the kūpapa Māori who had saved their town. By 1865, the New Zealand wars were losing their charm for the Imperial Army. Andrew Dillon Carberry, assistant surgeon of the 18th Royal Irish, recorded his jaded impressions of the colony in verse. Yes, Cook was the real hand that found out New Zealand and first put his foot on the island. When homeward he came, he rose to great fame and emigration was anxious to try land. Then the rogues of all nations and all convict stations set off to this wonderful island. Now the natives are done and away they have run to the ranges, the bush and the highland. And the settlers will keep the land they got cheap, the beautiful soil of the island. Oh, a wonderful island, a rough-looking, bluff-looking island. Each settler or digger may wallop the nigger. I'll never go back to that island. The rise of Paimarere took place at a time when the Imperial British government was getting increasingly disillusioned with the New Zealand wars. In the Waikato, invasion had ground to a halt by mid-1864. The British had won on points. They had conquered and confiscated a million acres of Māori land, but they'd been unable to knock out the King movement. Beyond the British front, the King country survived. An independent Māori state smack bang in the middle of the North Island. After the Battle of Gate Pa, General Cameron, commanding the Imperial forces, lost confidence in his ability to take completed modern Pa. He refused to undertake further operations in Waikato or Tauranga. The colonial government knew it was only a matter of time before London would withdraw the Imperial troops. Cameron was pressured to mount a campaign against a secondary bastion of Māori independence, South Taranaki, where Pai Marere was active. So, at the beginning of 1865, warships and transports steamed from Auckland to Whanganui to attack South Taranaki and its hauhau. A new invasion began. Like Auckland before it, Whanganui suddenly became a war town. The arrival of Cameron's army tripled the population at a stroke. 
business boom. At public houses like Honest John Gotti's Rutland Hotel, which advertised a sandwich and a pint of colonial beer for sixpence or five cents. Business also boomed in the houses of ill repute in the quarter known as the Rookery. The British Army, 3,200 Imperial regulars and 500 colonial troops in Kupapa, camped just north of Whanganui. The troops played cricket under the wondering gaze of Māori scouts. Captain George Greaves sustained the first wound of the invasion. His thumb was broken by a bouncer. On the 24th of January, 1865, Cameron advanced. The South Taranaki tribes, Ngāti Ruanui and Ngārauru, assembled their entire force to oppose him. But they only had 500 men to his 3,000. The Māori leaders built a modern part, Wereroa, but the temptation to revert to traditional tactics was too much. On the 24th and 25th of January, they attacked Cameron's camp at Nukumu in broad daylight. The British were shaken by this bold attack, which penetrated deep into their camp. But they repulsed the Māori assault, inflicting heavy casualties. Cameron pressed on, bypassing Wereroa and crossing the Waitotoro River, building redoubts and depots as he went. A week later, on the 12th of February, he entered Ngāti Ruanui territory. Behind him, Wereroa lost its importance. Most of the garrison left to defend their own homes. It was later occupied by colonial troops. Cameron was delayed when two supply ships were wrecked. But a month later, his troops pushed north across the Pātea River. Ngāte Ruanui made a desperate attempt to resist in the open, at Tenayo. They had just 100 warriors. Half were killed. Cameron's troops spent four days destroying the vast cultivations at Manutahi, a major Māori agricultural centre. He then marched on to the Wainonaro River and halted his advance once again. By now, Cameron's South Taranaki campaign was being mocked by the settlers. It was seen as slow and ineffective and was said to have earned him the Māori nickname of the Lame Seagull. It was true that Cameron advanced cautiously. He was now very wary of the modern path. But in fact, his methodical operations ripped open Māori South Taranaki like a tin opener. Cameron left New Zealand in August 1865 without regret. His replacement, Major General Trevor Chute, mounted a ruthless mopping-up operation in South Taranaki in the first two months of 1866. General Chute was energetic, bigoted and brave. When a Māori bullet cut a button from his uniform at one skirmish, he stood his ground and said, The niggers seem to have found me out. Chute was accompanied by Dr Isaac Featherston, the superintendent of Wellington Province, who strolled into battle wearing a dressing gown and smoking a cigar. They faced uncoordinated Māori resistance. Without a single leader, small groups fought in defence of their own villages, not from modern power. Chute stormed these villages without too much trouble. He then decided to show Māori that even the inland bush was no refuge. He made a famous march around Mount Taranaki to New Plymouth, entering the town under a triumphal arch built for the occasion. Despite the hero's welcome, the bush expedition around the mountain to New Plymouth was hardly triumphant. The troops got lost, ran out of supplies, and avoided starvation only by eating their own pack horses. Dr. Featherston couldn't join the triumphal entry into New Plymouth because he had lost his trousers during the terrible march. Chute's campaign was the last fought by Imperial troops in New Zealand. By 1866, London had withdrawn its legions from active operations. Colonial troops and Māori kūpapa took over the war against Māori resistors. Why did the willingness of Māori to fight on the Pākehā side increase so substantially? One reason was the withdrawal of Imperial troops. The need for soldiers forced the government to make better alliance bargains with the kūpapa. One carrot was the four Māori seats in Parliament, which at first went to kūpapa chiefs. Another factor may have been that Paimarere had strong elements of pan-tribalism, even nationalism. The great new poles on which its worship centred were arguably symbols of a national religion. Te Ua himself preached unity. Do not be concerned for your own village. No, be concerned for the whole land. Paimarere may have threatened tribalism and also some other Māori traditions, including chieftainship. 
Kupapa opposition could have been a reaction to these threats. It is possible that the later New Zealand wars conceal a forgotten revolution within Māoridom, a struggle between old and new, tribe and nation. Even today, some Māori dislike the very word kūpapa and see it as meaning quisling or traitor. In my opinion, that view is unfair. The kūpapa were not traitors in their own terms. They simply recognised no loyalty higher than the tribe. But it remains true that kūpapa were vital to the Pākehā war effort in the later New Zealand wars. There's a sense in which, from 1866, they replaced the Imperial Army. Whatever the reason, the day of the Imperial Generals was over. The day of kūpapa chiefs and colonist colonels had begun. At Camp Manawapō on the evening of Tuesday, 1st August, 1866, 217 men emerged from their tents and huts into the midwinter's cold. They formed up on the parade ground for inspection before moving out. The parade was no drill sergeant's dream. The blue uniforms were faded and slovenly, with regulation trousers and tunics replaced by various bits and pieces. Some men wore kilts for easier movement in the bush. The colonial army included men from all over the world, notably Australia. There were a great number of Irish recruits. It was down in Otago they called me, a government soldier for to be, to go up and fight the wild Maori in the forests of Taranaki. Volunteer units formed, and Whanganui Kupapa were prepared to answer the government call but only if they got better pay than the Pākehā troops. There was a fair share of misfits. Some troops fought each other rather than the enemy, or preferred drinking to eating. By my soul, tis a sorrowful story. I'm treated far worse than the dog. Do me damn this, they never can please them. They do always be stopping me grog. But many of the colonial troops were seasoned veterans. Some like the half Māori Richard Blake, were hardened killers. The main base of operations was Patea, a raw war town and dangerous port with 70 houses, three pubs and no churches. The commander of the colonial forces was Colonel Thomas MacDonnell. A big man, 34 years old, MacDonnell believed he understood the Māori well, claiming a kind of instinct which I seem to have whenever Māoris are concerned. A veteran of the Waikato War, he was the colony's favourite soldier, a New Zealand version of America's Colonel George Armstrong Custer. MacDonnell is the man to go out with. He will never allow anyone to be in front of him. For the six months since General Chute's devastating campaign, South Taranaki had been in a state of uneasy peace. But for the colonial government, peace was not the mere absence of fighting. It needed full Māori submission so that it could progressively survey and then occupy the lands it had decided to confiscate. It was this kind of peace that Colonel MacDonnell was setting out to enforce. MacDonnell had a civilian rival, Commissioner Robert Reed Paris. A week before MacDonnell's expedition, it seemed Paris might achieve the formal submission of Pokaikai, a Tangahoe village. MacDonnell did not want Robert Paris to get the credit for Pokaikai's submission. So on the 26th of July, 1866, the colonel sent his own ultimatum into the village of Pokaikai, insisting that it choose peace or war immediately. The next day, he received good news and bad news. The good news was that Pokaikai had rejected war and appointed an envoy to make formal peace. The bad news was that the envoy was bound for New Plymouth to make it with Robert Paris. On Friday, the 28th of July, MacDonnell rode north and intercepted the envoy, Natanahira Nahina. The two men ate together and talked. There was no dispute about peace, but with whom was it to be made? Nahina pleaded the will of his people. Magda, now look at me. I am between your hardness and the hardness of the people. I have not power to go with you because the people told me to go to Mr. Paris. Until 10 o'clock that night, Magdanel berated and pressured Nahina in an effort to persuade him to make peace then and there with Colonel MacDonnell rather than with Commissioner Paris. Finally, Nahina said that he'd go away and sleep on it. The next morning, 
McDonnell received a polite message. With all due respect to the Colonel, Nahina felt that he had to abide by the will of his people and he was now well on his way to New Plymouth to make peace with Commissioner Paris. McDonnell was absolutely enraged. He decided, in his own words, that fighting must commence and he wrote two letters. The first was sent to the Defence Minister, Theodore Haltain. Sir, I beg to state that since my arrival in these districts, I have had considerable difficulty in dealing with the rebel natives, owing, I am convinced, to the interference of Mr. Paris. The second letter was sent to Tukino, the chief of Pukaikai. It was designed to place the village off its guard. Oh, friend, Tukino, salutations to you and the people and all the tribe. I intend tomorrow to go to Patea. On my return, I intend to go to Otapawa, near Pokaikai, and see you there. This is all. From your friend, MacDonnell. But MacDonnell did not go to Patea as he had promised to Kino. Instead, on the 1st of August, 1866, he and his 217 men marched through the night to bring peace to Pokaikai. Just before midnight, the colonial troops hid themselves in karaka bushes 600 metres from Pukaikai. A few of the inhabitants were still up and about. It is hard to imagine a place less on its guard than Pukaikai that night. Its envoy Nahina was in New Plymouth, having formalised peace with the proper civil authority. The villagers had repeatedly agreed to peace with MacDonnell and were perfectly convinced that he had too. MacDonnell waited for full quiet to descend on the village. He would have waited longer, but there were problems with his men. The night was literally freezing cold, a real Taranaki frost. A number of men countered the cold with rum. MacDonnell could not guarantee sufficient silence from nervous, cold and tipsy men for very long. A few moments after 1am, he ordered the attack, telling his men not to fire unless they had to, but to use the bayonet. The colonial troops charged with an unearthly yell. It was too much to expect that excited men would hold their fire any longer. The battle cry was followed by a strong fusillade. Tukino was up and out of his house on hearing the rush of the men, as he put it. Seeing that there was no chance of anything but headlong flight, he called to his people not to fire and flung himself down the steep gully, naked as he was. Tukino did manage to grab a rifle as he fled, but most Māori did not have time to pick up their guns. One Pākehā admitted that the troops fired with scarcely a shot being returned. I could not help but pity them, roused by a yell almost enough to raise the dead, and by firing through and through their furries. Most of the shocked and frozen fugitives fled into the bush with nothing but their lives. Others were not so lucky. Nahina's wife, Marta, emerged from her house to see her parents lying dead on their doorstep. I remained standing at my own door with a child in my arms. A soldier came up and pulled at her shark's tooth earring, but could not free the ornament. Do not rob me whilst I am alive. You'd better shoot me! Instead, the soldier drew a knife and cut the earring off, slicing Marta's hand as she tried to protect herself while holding her child. As grey dawn broke, the soldiers rummaged the loot before setting fire to Pokaikai. One man got 15 subs. <laughs> of course, I was not in luck's way. Standing outside her house, her village burning around her, her parents dead at her feet, Marta confronted MacDonnell. It was very wrong to attack the village while my husband was absent. He's gone to Taranaki to Mr. Paris to make peace. Who is Mr. Paris? I am the person with whom peace should be made. Pokaikai was not the first massacre of the New Zealand wars. It was not the last, and numerically it was by no means the worst either. Both Māori and Pākehā killed far more unarmed people on other occasions. But Pokaikai did have significant consequences. Its most public epilogue was a commission of inquiry held in 1868, much to the disgust of MacDonnell and most other colonists. The commission heard 19 witnesses, including Marta. One commissioner, to his credit, found that the attack was unnecessary, improper and unjust. But the other two outvoted him and exonerated MacDonnell. But all Tangahoe and their Ngāti Ruanui kin remembered Pukaikai. One, the child of a Tangahoe woman, was to remember best of all. There are no verifiable photographs of him, but his image lives in wood. 
This whare, since destroyed by fire, shows the one-eyed man who gave Pokaikai its greatest epilogue, Titokawaru's War. Late in 1866, Te Ua, founder of Paimarere, died, and several new Taranaki prophets took on his mantle. Each developed his own creed and his own mana. They were not mere clones of Te Ua. The prophets included Te Fiti Oromai and Tohu Kākahi, who established the remarkable community of Parehaka, a haven of peace. Another prophet, born here at Taikatū, was a Naruhine chief named Rifa Titokwaru. Like Te Fiti and Te Ua, Titokwaru had done time as a Methodist preacher and he knew his Bible very well. The compassionate uh, feeling to people, the love for people, it was ingrained into him as an infant that uh, took him to great height uh, as a, an adult and before he became a warrior. Titokawaru established a village near Hawara, Tenutu Utemanu, the beak of the bird. Initially a place of peace, like Tefiti's Parihaka, it was to become better known as a place of bloody deeds. During 1867 and 1868, Titokawaru mounted a remarkable peace campaign. He held a series of big peace meetings at Tenutu Utemanu. He travelled all the way from Mount Taranaki in the north down to the Whanganui River in the south seeking to bring peace to the whole tortured region. His efforts were praised by resident magistrate James Booth in 1867. He's shown the most untiring energy in his efforts to bring other tribes to make peace. By mid-1868, partly due to Titokawaru's efforts, the colonists were beginning to hope that they had seen the last of the New Zealand wars. But there was one problem, creeping confiscation. Porerawa. A Taranaki i mātau e pēweta te nui o te ia kaipenua o te uiwi. In 1865, the colonial government had declared vast tracts of Taranaki land to be confiscated. This was a paper exercise that was put into practice only gradually. Soldiers and surveyors moved on to a piece of land, measured it up, then handed it over to settlers and civilian buyers. Surrounded by troops and with no single leader to coordinate resistance, Māori reluctantly accepted the loss of land in return for peace. As confiscation crept on, bite by bite, the goodwill of the peacemaker Titokawaru was strained to breaking point. The final straw came when some of his own Naruahine people were made prisoners. Titokawaru's peace was over. Titokawaru's war had begun. In their first strike on the 9th of June 1868, his warriors ambushed and killed three military settlers near Kete Marae. The government reacted promptly. The colonial army, now known as the Armed Constabulary, was augmented by volunteer units from Nelson, New Plymouth and Wellington, each farewelled by cheering hometown crowds. Within three months, the Patea Field Force, to use its official title, numbered almost a thousand men. The advance base was Camp Waihi, close to the boundary between government territory and the area controlled by Titokawaru. The colonist commander, McDonnell, planned to wait, train his troops, and then strike into the bush north of the Wainonoro, burning cultivations and forcing Māori to fight at a disadvantage, just as he had done in the Pōkaikai campaign. He had some formidable lieutenants, among them the great Whanganui Kupapa, Major Kea Te Rangi Hiwinui. Pākehā knew him as Major Kemp and were proud to fight under his command. The political leader of the Whanganui Kupapa was the shrewd Metekini Paitahi. MacDonnell's other chief lieutenant was the legendary Prussian mercenary Gustavus Fontemski. He had led a colourful life fighting around the world before consolidating his position in New Zealand as a romantic and swashbuckling master of irregular warfare. He was also a gifted artist. His paintings leave an important record of the New Zealand wars. Titokawaru too had some veteran warriors. But Māori sources make it clear 
that with about 80 men to McDonnell's 1,000, he faced odds of 12 to 1. If ever a resistance effort seemed hopeless at the outset, it was Titokawaru's war. Titokawaru's only hope was to provoke McDonnell into attacking him at a time and place of his own choosing. The place, he decided, would be Tenuto to Manu. The village would be bait for the colonists. During June, Titokawaru's few dozen warriors raided south of the Wainonoro, threatening farms behind the colonist front. Pressure began to build from the government, from the newspapers, and from McDonnell's own subconscious. He had the force, why wasn't he using it? The decisive raid occurred on the 12th of July, when 60 Naruahine warriors attacked a small redoubt called Turuturu Mokai, a mere three miles from Camp Waihi. Titokawaru's plan was to provoke McDonnell by decimating the garrison, not to take the redoubt. His warriors killed and wounded 16 of the 21-man garrison, losing only three or four themselves. Soon after the Māori withdrew, McDonnell arrived, accompanied by Captain John Roberts. They walked among the corpses, which included McDonnell's friend, Captain Edward Ross. Roberts recorded his commander's reaction. When we had gone a short distance, McDonnell said, sit down. Drawing his sword, he extended the blade gleaming brightly in the winter moonlight, kissed it and said dramatically, Roberts, I shall have revenge for this. Tito Kowaru coupled his pinprick raids with propaganda. In a letter for the colonists, he made it clear that he was waiting for them at Tenutu. Although a thousand should go, he will be found at Tenutu at Temanu. Should even the whole island rise against him, he will stay at Tenutu at Temanu with his women and his children. A few days after the war broke out, Titokawaru's men had surprised and killed a lone trooper, Tom Smith. Smith's body was taken back to Tenutu and eaten. Titokawaru did not partake of the ritual himself, but used it to provoke fear and a desire for immediate retaliation in the Pakia. In another letter, he rammed home the point. A word for you. Cease traveling on the roads. I've begun to eat human flesh, and my throat is constantly open for the flesh of man. I shall not die. I shall not die. When death itself is dead, I shall be alive. By the end of July, McDonnell had abandoned his plan. He thought of nothing else but attacking Tenutu or Temanu as soon as he possibly could. On the 7th of September, 1868, after two aborted attempts, McDonnell clashed in full battle with Titokawaru at Tenutu. At 3 a.m. that morning, the colonel slipped silently out of Camp Waihi with 360 of his best troops, Māori and Pākehā. They crossed the Wainonoro and entered the bush about dawn, moving quietly in three divisions, under Major Kepa, Major Von Temsky and Major William McGee Hunter. They circled around the bush near Tenutu and moved in from the north, hoping for surprise. But Tito Kowaru was waiting for them. The government troops stumbled across a group of young boys in a clearing close to Tenutu. They killed one. Another, Omohura, was taken prisoner and later adopted by a Pakia politician. McDonnell now knew that he had lost the advantage of surprise. He pushed on quickly to the large Tenutu clearing. The pa at its southern end seemed weak, so the commander sent two divisions forward around the fringes of the clearing. Von Temsky to the right, Kepa to the left. McDonnell himself remained in the centre with Hunter's division. Then Tito Kowaru sprang his trap. He sent most of his men out of the pa through secret paths and tunnels to prepared firing positions in the bush. Some were in hollow tree trunks. Others were camouflaged rifle pits like the bunkers of modern jungle warfare. Believing the enemy were in the tops of trees, McDonnell's troops poured volley after volley into the foliage, but to no avail. Men now began to drop fast. Some of the hidden warriors had more than one gun. And the colonist survivors described their fire as terrific, fearful. A 
soon as we entered the clearing, we came under fire from front, right, and rear. But except within the palisading in the clearing to our front, we could see no enemy. Naturally, the colonists continued to focus on the path, the palisades directly in front of them. But in reality, it was a diversion, a false target, a static feint. While they focused on it, they were picked off from the firing positions all around this clearing on their flanks. If they stayed under cover, they were picked off slowly. If they stood up, deployed in the open, in preparation for assaulting the par and seeking to win the battle positively, they were picked off fast. Caught in this cleft stick, Macdonell had no option but to retreat. On the right flank, von Temsky's division did not realise that the other divisions were hard pressed. Von Temsky believed a brisk assault on the par could still win the battle and felt that Macdonell was mishandling it. He stood up, cut irritably at a bush vine with his sword and spoke to a companion. I'm disgusted. If I get out of this scrape, I will wash my hands clean of the business. As he stood, controlled volleys of three or four shots rang out from nearby. A small group of reserves had been sent by Tito Kowaru onto Bontemski's flank. They included Tutange, Wayonu. An officer with a curved sword came out in clear view of us within a very short distance of where we were crouching. I fired with the others. One of our bullets struck him. I have always believed it was mine. Vontemski fell, killed by a shot through the centre of the forehead. His leaderless division broke up and retreated through the bush. The other divisions had left and the survivors were hunted through the bush by Tito Kowaru's warriors. About 50 Pākehā were killed and wounded. When the pursuing warriors returned in triumph to Tenutu, Tito Kowaru gave the corpse of Von Temsky this epitaph. In the days of the past, you fought here and you fought there, and you boasted that you would always emerge safely from your battles to the bright world of life. But when you encountered me, your eyes were closed in their last sleep. It could not be helped. You sought your death at my hands, and now you sleep forever. The colonial forces were badly shaken by the disaster at Tenutu and the death of Von Temsky. Camp Waihi and scores of farms were abandoned. Men like Major George Cumming were haunted by bush fright, the equivalent of shell shock. If I'm asked to go into the bush again, I will resign my commission. Von Temsky's own proud unit mutinied and was disbanded. Macdonell blamed everyone but himself for the disastrous defeat. He was eventually sacked. Unlike his contemporary Colonel George Custer, he failed to die at his last stand. History never forgave him. But Defence Minister Theodore Haltain kept his nerve and set about raising a new army. Most importantly, he found a new commander. Colonel George Stoddart Whitmore was an Imperial officer who had settled in Hawke's Bay after fighting in South Africa and the Crimea. He also fought several campaigns as a colonial commander on the East Coast. In the wake of the Tenutu disaster, he replaced Macdonnell as commander of the Patea Field Force. I go on a totally different principle to Macdonnell. I keep my distance from all the force. I am never a hail fellow well met with anybody. I live at my own establishment with Mr. Foster, who is a gentleman and suits me very well. To say Whitmore was unpopular with his men is understatement. He was described as a little, conceited, egotistical, self-sufficient ass. Not even his mother could accuse Whitmore of charm. But he was perhaps the most able European commander of the entire New Zealand wars. He was a hard taskmaster and quickly rebuilt the Patea field force. Yet even Whitmore was soon forced to dance like a puppet on Tito Kowaru's string. After Tenutu, Tito Kowaru moved south, the first substantial reconquest of Māori land since the Taranaki War. New followers joined him, but his warriors still did not exceed 150 or 200. He positioned himself just north of Patea, where he and Whitmore faced each other for a couple of weeks. Then, at the end of October 1868, the Māori forces suddenly disappeared. Riddle me, riddle me, re, where can those Māoris be? Where do you think we'll find them? Little Whitmore is fast asleep. The how hows know where to find him. If he doesn't look out and mind what he's about, Tito will get behind him. Tito Kowaru did get behind Whitmore. 
moving rapidly through the bush inland of colonist and kupapa patrols. He and all his people move south to Okotoku, near Wairoa, now Waverley. There, they began building a pa. Tito Kowaru sent a party to raid the upsettlements of Whanganui. By threatening the soft underbelly behind the colonists, he was again forcing his enemy to attack him at a time and place of his own choosing. Whitmore took the bait. I felt that I must do something at once, or Titakawaru would neglect my force and invade the settled districts. The fiery little commander shifted his base from Patea to Wairoa. On the 7th of November, he and 600 of his men marched out to attack Titokawaru at his Okotoku Pa, called Moturoa. Here on the top of Okotoku Hill, you can still follow Titokawaru's logic. The hilltop itself seems the obvious place to fortify, but it was the site of a village overrun by General Chute in 1866, and Titokawaru simply disregarded it. Instead, he built his pa on the flat ground below. There was a single line of fortifications, seemingly open on both flanks. In fact, the line formed a narrow waste between areas of heavily bushed and broken ground. Even the single visible line seemed weak. Its wooden palisade was flimsy, but it concealed strong earthworks. A trench, a bank above it, and squat bastions made of packed earth and fern. These hidden defences gave the defenders three firing levels. Whitmore's force was reduced by the defection of some kupapa, whom he had insulted, but he still had about 400 men to Titokoru's 150. Scouts said the power was unfinished, and when Whitmore crept to the edge of the clearing, it seemed true. There was no sound, and the power looked weak. The palisades were new and neatly put up, but in no way different to the ordinary Kaenga palings, miserable affairs. I could easily have cut the lot with my clasp knife. Assuming the power was weak and its garrison unaware, Whitmore launched his attack. A frontal assault on the left front of the par under Major Hunter, supported by an outflanking move under Kerper. But the par was alert. Kerper's men were held up by hidden defences in the bush and never got into position. Hunter's storming party met a triple sheet of fire. Hunter was killed. Kerper was pushed back. The storming party was pinned down and annihilation threatened. Some of the rebels had come out of the par into the bush on our flank. We were exposed to their fire, which was very close. One poor fellow was coming to where I was when he was shot through the chest and fell with blood running from his nose and mouth. Whitmore sent in another unit under Captain John Roberts across the clearing to try to save the remains of the storming party. Roberts managed it, but as the whole force retreated, the Maori garrison emerged from the pa and went over to the attack. Constable Eastwood was frightfully tomahawked, his head cut in slices, and the expression on his face is something awful. His eyes are almost turned in their sockets. Whitmore kept better control of his retreat than MacDonnell had at Tenutu. But it was a battered and dispirited force of colonists in Kupapa who made it back to the Wairoa Redoubt, 50 men fewer than they had been. Salutations to you. This is a question to you. To whom does England belong? To whom does this upon which you stand belong? This is my word to you. You were made a Pākehā, and England was given to you for your tribe. I was made a Māori, and New Zealand was given to me. Move off from my place to your own. Arise that you may be baptised, that your sins may be washed away, and call upon the name of the Lord. Sufficient. From Titokawaru. Titokawaru's letter had to be taken seriously. He had now defeated the main colonial force twice in succession. He had reconquered the whole of South Taranaki, apart from the fortified Pākehā islands of Pātea and Wairo. Titokawaru's following had grown to about a thousand people, 400 of them warriors. He moved south to within striking distance of Whanganui town. The King movement began to consider re-entering the war in alliance with him, and Pākehā New Zealand panicked. Settlers abandoned their homes and fled Whanganui. The greatest alarmist, the most faint-hearted of croakers, could not have dreamed of a retrogression so great. Where is it to end? 
In January 1869, Whitmore emerged from the defences around Whanganui Town and advanced on Titokoru's new pa near Nukumaru, Tauranga Ika. Tauranga Ika was Titokoru's masterpiece, an immensely strong modern pa, probably with further defences concealed in the bush outside it. Whitmore himself later conceded that he could not have taken it by storm. No troops in the world could have hewn their way through a double row of strong palisades, backed by rifle pits and flanked by two-story erections, defended by excellent shots and desperate men. It is a really strong par which could not have been rushed. Quite impossible. But the colonists did not know this as they prepared to assault in the first days of February, and they were hopeful. So was the Māori garrison. The troops camped in the trenches close to the par and sang camp songs. The Māori applauded them and taunted them to come on. Go on, Pākehā! Give us some more! Come on, Pākehā! Be food for the Māori! Send all the fat ones in front! But on the morning of the 3rd of February, the colonist army found that Tauranga Ika was empty. The confident garrison had left during the night. Titokawaru's army then simply collapsed. Allied tribes abandoned him and returned to their homes, while he, with a diminishing band of his closest supporters, managed to delay the colonists' pursuit. Whitmore made very sure that that pursuit was vigorous. He encouraged his men with monetary rewards for the heads of dead enemies. But he was still unable to catch Titokawaru, who escaped into the dense bush of North Taranaki. But the colonists reconquered South Taranaki and burned its Māori villages and cultivations yet again. The silence of devastation descended again on war-torn South Taranaki. <laughs> Titokawaru lost his war, but the Pākehā can scarcely be said to have won it. He was not defeated in battle, and the reasons for the abandonment of Tauranga Ika and the breakup of his army remain uncertain to this day. One theory was that he was having an affair with the wife of an Allied chief. Kimball Bent, an American deserter from the British Army who loyally followed Titokawaru, confirmed this in his memoirs. This misdemeanor was, in Maori eyes, fatal to his prestige as an araki and a war leader. He had trampled on his tapu. His run of luck had turned. A council of the people was held, and many an angry speech was made. At length it was decided that the garrison should leave the pa. This met with general approval and on the night of the attack, the people packed their few belongings on their backs and struck quietly into the forest. Whatever the reasons, Titokawaru's resistance collapsed when he was at the very height of his success. His was surely a remarkable achievement even so, sweeping south from the mountain all the way to the Whanganui River, defeating two much larger colonial forces in major battles along the way, genuinely threatening Pākehā control of the whole west coast of the North Island. Yet just as remarkable was the way in which Titokawaru's war was forgotten. Until the 1980s, General Histories of New Zealand did not so much as mention his name. It was as though he came too close to victory to be comfortably remembered. Instead, he was forgotten by Pākehā history as a child forgets a nightmare. Thank <laughs> you.